second event of our 2019 Dialogue Series. I am very pleased to see so many of you joining us tonight for this event, and I know that we have more coming uh, who are in line, so please feel free to help them uh, join seats that are vacant next to you. This year's theme speaks directly to the way in which American history is produced, not just in one version, the official narration, but through a many uh, voices of diverse peoples and communities who make up this nation in which we live. Since we are a nation of immigrants, at each point in history, some of us or our families were born outside of this country. And although our nation has, at times, prided itself on welcoming immigrants, historically, uh, there has been some marked ambivalence toward them. As tonight's guest has written, immigrants are often used as a source of inexpensive labor, but then deprived of basic liberties and rights. Immigration is often touted as bringing innovation and industriousness, but then vilified as causing strife and discord. Immigrants themselves and their children live in a liminal space between these poles. They often speak two languages, inhabit two cultures, and feel a dual loyalty to their two homes. Almost all immigrants experience this duality. For people of Japanese descent, this was dramatized during World War II when the U.S. government relocated them into internment camps, or as Dr. Nakadati says, incarcerated them without charges. Many of them were American-born, some were naturalized citizens, others were immigrants with permission to work. Regardless of their status, all people of Japanese descent were required to report to the U.S. government's custody in parts of the United States and the West. Some of them stayed for months, others for years. Many lost homes, businesses, and loved ones while in custody. But this violation by the United States government was only part of their story. Even before the war, Japanese Americans faced legal barriers to owning property, marrying freely, and applying for citizenship. These realities shape their lives in many ways, painful and poignant, as betrayed in Dr. Nakadati's book, Looking After Minidoka, an American Memoir. I'm sure you would notice that this title was chosen purposefully, which I hope that he will speak about in a moment. But for now, I want to add a personal reflection. Although this story centers around Japanese Americans, in many ways it says a lot about the variability of the U.S. attitudes towards immigrant grant groups during times of national insecurity. It also poses some profound questions about how our nation can create a more radically inclusive culture into which immigrants can be welcomed regardless of political tensions. Dr. Nakadati, thank you for writing this book and for coming all the way from Iowa to be with us tonight. And on a personal note, I do want to say, and you'll hear a little bit more about this, uh, I've been profoundly influenced by many teachers in my life. Um, we've all had the benefit of working with many uh, faculty who change your lives. Without a doubt, uh, Dr. Neil Nakadati, while I was an undergraduate at Iowa State University, uh, profoundly changed my life. So it is uh, quite humbling and also an honor for me to have him here today uh, to talk with him about his writing. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to introduce Steve Hall, editor of Bethesda Magazine, and our media sponsor for this series to introduce and tell you a little bit more about this phenomenal man we have here today. Steve? Thank you so much, and thank you, Darian. One of the last times I saw Dr. Pollard was at a countywide spelling bee where, let's get the record straight, a team of editors from Bethesda Magazine may have defeated a team of uh, faculty and staff from a certain community college in Montgomery, college, in Montgomery County. Yes. Um, for next year, 2020, the spelling bee, uh, Dr. Pollard and I have a bet. Mm -hmm. We're both very much into fitness, into working out, and the loser next year um, has to do 100 squats. And um, so I hope you've been training. There we go. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, 
tonight, this whole series, but tonight in particular, um, I think is particularly meaningful, um, partly just because we are in Montgomery County, where a, more than a third of the residents were born outside this country. Um, one of the fascinating things to me about um, immigrant population here is that um, there's no group of people um, more than four, representing more than 14%. Um, our people who live here are from all over the world. And it is an imperfect place, but it is an incredibly welcoming um, and just a great place to have this conversation. I might add before I introduce um, Dr. Nakadadi that um, I too had a professor um, at the University of Connecticut a long time ago, Evan Hill, who years later when I was being interviewed for an article, um, um, the interviewer asked me to uh, identify the three most in, uh, important and inf influential people in my life. It was my mother, my father, and Dr. Evan Hill. And uh, I understand just how profound that influence can be. And I'm eager to hear um, about your relationship tonight. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Neil Nakadadi. Um, Dr. Nakadadi is a graduate of Stanford University and earned his MA and PhD at Indiana University. After 40 years teaching English, primarily American literature, um, he is a university professor emeritus um, Iowa State University. As one of his undergraduate students, who is seated right here, um, Dr. Pollard described him as a teacher who, quote, made me think, humbled me, built me up, and made me better. Dr. Nakadadi is a recipient of the Iowa State University Foundation Award for a career achievement in teaching, and he is a past president of the Board of Directors of Humanities Iowa. His writing has appeared in numerous publications, including Athlon, Cottonwood, Isle, and interestingly, the Annals of Internal Medicine. He has edited two books on Robert Penn Warren, co-authored two books on rhetoric and writing, and has written a critical study of novelist Jane Smiley. His most recent book is Looking After Minidaka, an American memoir, which insightfully blends stories of his family with the history of three generations of Japanese Americans from immigration through the 20th century. It's my pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Neil Nakadati. Thank you. So I'm going to start off with an easy question. Uh, you never gave me easy ones, but I'm going to give you an easy one right now. And I realize that it's fraught for many Asian Americans. Uh, do people ask you where you're from? And how do you answer if they do? And then why is this question, you think, a different for Asian Americans than perhaps other second generation immigrants in the United States? Well, I think, let me start with the end of that. Uh, it's asked because an Asian, you know, Asian person is clearly from somewhere else. So you can't blend in with the wallpaper, you know, you can't, you're not just, you get asked the question. Now, there are different answers well, uh, I want to give you the answer that my father w gave when he was growing up in Portland. People would say, well, who are you? Where are you from? And he'd say, my mom and pop were born in Japan. I was born here. Okay, next question, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when I'm asked that, uh, and I have been asked that, I will say, well, obviously, obviously I don't look like I'm, I'm an Iowan. I was born in Indiana. <laughs> And then I explain, as I do uh, in my book, why I am a Hoosier. And it's, it's a way of saying, uh, in the United States, we're, we're all from somewhere else. Mm. And a lot of us have moved, or our families have moved, for one reason or another. And uh, so I, I will say, um, short answer is I was born in Indiana, grew up in Portland, Oregon you know, and here I am, or grew up in Portland, Oregon, went to Indiana University, taught at the University of Texas, taught at Iowa State, and here I am, depending on how much time they have to listen to this story. But that, I don't know if that answers the question, but I'd, Asian, an Asian person will be at, is more likely to get asked that. So and do you think that is a way of validating your Americanness for them? I think it is. I think I think it's partly a way of saying I, I'm from all over mm -hmm. this country, mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, I think it's it's partly a way of 
uh, maybe deflecting that, the, where that question was going to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. So you do, I think, a, a really extraordinary job of writing both a cultural history of Japanese Americans and a personal memoir of your family. I think the dichotomy is captured in the title itself of the book. Uh, you write with great insight about the values and traditions that informed uh, their perspective. And at the same time, you never claim that their experiences <coughs> excuse me, are comprehensive are necessarily representative of all Japanese Americans. Can you talk a little bit about how you accomplished that? I can tell you, <coughs> thank you for saying that. If I accomplished it, it's because I was aware from the beginning that there was no one single story. Uh, and that started with understanding the different stories of members of my family and friends of mine, Japanese American friends, contemporaries. And I said, well, it's hard to take any one of these as the, the story, uh, but taken together, a person could get a sense of the range of experience um, in the, uh, among Japanese Americans. So uh, I, I try to make it a point of understanding and asking questions about and researching uh, the diversity of the experience within that hmm. community. Um, and uh, I said to myself, I said, even within my own family, there's a wide range of experience, um, but even that doesn't cover everything. Mm -hmm. So that was one of my responsibilities, was to, to make sure I, at every turn, I, I made an attempt to account for more than one thread of the story. Mm. Um, it's easy to focus on one thing or another because, just because it's easier. But I didn't, I was at a point where I just needed to tell the story as best I could, and as best I could had to include even the, even the stuff that was difficult, that didn't come to me easily, so. Talk yeah. to me about writing the book, because I know we had some conversation over dinner about how you went to write this book, and, um, and, and how that process was both uh, cathartic, uh, but also um, wrenching uh, to a certain extent. Can you talk about the, that process of putting together this narrative that you have, this memoir? Um, a certain number of the stories within the larger story of the book were stories that I'd heard mm -hmm. through my family. So I had this oral history and I'd heard stories, a lot of them, more than once. And, and, uh, and I said, there's, and, and at the same time, I said, there's, there's stuff I don't know. There are things missing here. You know? And then the more I read about the experience during the war, I said, there's even more than I thought that's missing. Why is it missing? And uh, so what, one way to get into that uh, into that. This answer is to say that in 1992, when my son Nick was born, I was speaking to my mother about reading about the camps, and I said, how come you have not talk, told us more about the camp experience? Because you were there with your parents, and then you were able to leave, and then you had to go back, you know, for reasons in the, within the family, and you took me with you. And, but you have never really said much more than what I just told you. She said, well, it was too painful. She said, it was too painful. And um, then she looked at me and she said, and maybe this was because, see, the next generation was coming along, you know, my children. And she said, well, maybe I could start talking about it now. And so after that, I never went to their house without a tape recorder. Mm -hmm. And as I tell students, yeah, there was this little tape that went around, and <laughs> spool and all that. And, but I started getting, and I did the same thing with my dad, but uh, his, of course, his experience was a little different because he was in the service and so on. But um, I realized that I had to collect parts of the story anywhere from any source mm -hmm. I could including other relatives, including research in the library, including, my mother was a child of 
both parents were children of the Depression, right? So uh, this means my mother never threw anything away. <laughs> so I went down in the basement, and it was like an archaeological dig to get in. But I knew she had all kinds of interesting things that might help me. And yes, she had saved uh, directories of the community, the Japanese American community in Portland. All the businesses and the, you know, the families, and they were in the directory and so on. Uh, there were rosters of organizations. Uh, there was the membership list for the JACL. There were all kinds of things there. And so it was messy in the sense that it wasn't like getting online and finding everything online. Mm -hmm. Some of it was in boxes and some of it was in shoe boxes and so on. But, and I, to this day, I don't know if I really found everything, but I found enough to, to understand the story. Mm. Um, Her office sounds like your office used yes, to look well, like, I, Dr. Dr. I learned from an expert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because not everyone here has read your book yet, and, and we've provided uh, copies for uh, particular students and guests here, I wonder if you could give us an idea and talk a little bit about which of the values of the samurai culture survived in 20th century Japan. And what I'm thinking about is, is the Japan in which your parents were born. And this is important, I think, because some of those values have continued into future generations that have never set, set foot in Japan. Would you think that's a fair statement? Yeah, yeah. I, I, th I think that, um, for example, loyalty mm. and um, perseverance are two of the things. Uh, but uh, from samurai... Uh, there are a couple others that I'm trying to remember offhand or off the top of my head. But in addition to that, there were values from um, uh, Shintoism and Buddhism that became um, part of their, what, ethos? Mm -hmm. Ethos is not a Japanese word, is it? <laughs> uh, but uh, like um, uh, in Buddhism, there's a kind of reverence for learning. Well, that translates into education, right? What we would call education. And um, there's a kind of respect in uh, Shinto, in the Shinto faith, there's a, a reverence for your, uh, uh, there's filial piety, reverence for your family. Um, and these things got passed down, even if, like as in my family, they were Methodist. So they're Methodist, but you, you can still see the, what the, the residual Japanese, the values that you can associate with Japan. Now, when they were growing up in Japan, my grandparents now, before they came to the United States, their, um, the emperor, the Meiji emperor, had um, issued a rescript, like a declaration, I guess you'd say. I want to say 1892. But on education, and he had said uh, education uh, and learning about the rest of the world will be important to the, to the development and status of Japan in the 20th century. And so every village is going to have a school, hmm. and all the children will go to this school, and in effect, he didn't have to say, and I'm the emperor, and it's going to happen. Because he was the emperor, and it was going to happen, right? And so my grandparents grew up under the, uh, what, the, uh, the dictate of, the, of the, the statement by the emperor that there would be education. Education was, is tied to the well-being hmm. and development of the country. Just as he said, they have these... Railroads in America, we need a railroad. You know, we need to understand modern transportation. And so those, those values got carried over when my grandparents came over, that generation. Not just my grandparents, but others came. Education was really important to them. Hmm. And I think that for Japanese in the United States, or the next generation, uh, this is one of the reasons there was such an emphasis on education and such high achievement because it was 
if it was just part of their belief system, mm -hmm. just like filial piety and courage. And it started with a question about yep. the samurai. But all of these things blended in, even if you never call them, oh, well, this, we get this piece from Buddhism, you know. But it was there. Mm. It was there. So it strikes me that um, many immigrant groups in the United States face the issue of how to resist assimilation. Now, so these values that you talk about, which are so ingrained um, at a family level, almost at a visceral level of who they may be, oftentimes may come in conflict or may be similar than this other culture of which they are becoming a part of. Um, and, and this idea of resisting assimilation so that you don't lose portions of yourself to yourself, I think is oftentimes um, critical to the immigrant experience. Your uncle's experience was a unique one in that he was raised in the U.S., but then went back to Japan in his adult life and ended up working as an interpreter and a translator. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what you think, uh, how that was a part of his uh, resistance to assimilation or not? Oh, I don't know if it was his resistance. It was, it was he was following orders mm. uh, in part. Uh, this is my father's, this is nice. What have I done? <laughs> <laughs> Your mic's acting Your mic died. <laughs> Rest in peace. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I'll try to do this. Is this all right? Is this close enough? Uh, uh, in my father's family, there was my father and then his younger brother, uh, Toru. And, my fa and, uh, and this speaks to the education, mm -hmm. uh, the whole business of education. My grandparents um, were uh, convinced that their sons would both, th th there were some, uh, there were a few choices that they, the options that they had. They could become doctors or maybe lawyers, or maybe enter the clergy. This is a short list. <laughs> My dad, was lucky because he always wanted to be a doctor and so he became a doctor uh, my uncle was more uh, he was a younger brother you know and he well he graduated from high school and got a job with the uh, import company that my grandfather worked for furia company in portland and then one day his mo his mother said what are you doing with your life, basically? He says, show me your hands. Well, his hands were all beat up from uh, lugging sacks mm -hmm. of rice and crates with vegetables in them. And she said, this is not, this won't do. Hmm. You're going to go to college. And um, uh, meanwhile, I should say my, my grandfather had made enough money in the U.S. to send money back to his brothers in Japan. And they had started up a... Uh, uh, an electrical, what we would call a contracting company. And so the, our American side of our family had an investment in this company. So my grandfather said to my uncle, who was carrying crates of, you know, and tubs of tofu and so on, said, you're going to go to college, and you're going to major in business, business administration, which at that time they called commerce and you're going to become part of that company in Japan. Now, he didn't want to do this, but he, he had to do it. I mean, he was following orders. Hmm. So he went, and he, uh, and there were other uh, American, there were other Nisei boys who were over there, born in the U.S., graduated from high school in the United States, and then went over to school in Japan. And then, of course, he fell in love. And he married a Japanese woman and ended up, that's where they were when the war started. So the war started, my, part of my family, my dad was in the United States, my uncle was in Japan, and he was worried he was going to get drafted into the Japanese army. And he's a, basically, he's an American kid who liked football, baseball, and whatever, movies, American movies. Um, that question, there, there are a couple ways to get into that question. Mm -hmm. Can I take another minute? You can go whatever. 
for a lot of the Nisei, the American, the first generation of, of Japanese Americans born in the United States, uh, they often went to Japanese school. Now, I don't know if I see already, I'm getting these looks. Maybe that's not true for some people. But in Portland, most of the kids went to Japanese school. So on Saturday, and I think one or two days after public school, they went to Japanese language school. It's hard to teach the language in a vacuum. Oh. So the culture and the language are part, you know, they're, they're together. So you're learning the culture. Why are you doing this? Well, the parents said, you, we need you to go to Japanese language school because you need to know the language of your ancestors or of your family. You have family in Japan. How are you going to write to them? Oh. Right? And um, th so it's tied with in, with the fact that, tied to the fact that your own parents are not, are not fluent in English. So the, 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 you learn how to speak, when you're learning how to speak, you're learning how to speak Japanese. M many Japanese American, uh, Nisei, the American born Japanese, spoke Japanese until they went to public school. They spoke Japanese at home. And then uh, if even in their own neighborhood, if it's a mostly a Japanese neighborhood, they spoke Japanese to the other mm -hmm. kids. So it's partly, it's less resisting assimilation as promoting the language or, you know, of, or, or staying with or sustaining the language of your parents and your grandparents off, off in Kofu or wherever it would be. Now, my mother and my aunt both went to Japanese school all the way through 12th grade. So they were beautifully fluent. They were good writers of Japanese and very good speakers. My uncle started playing hooky from Japanese school in the eighth grade, I think. Of course, during the war, he ended up needing to know Japanese because he was in the U.S. Army in the military intelligence service. Oh. And I think he wished he had learned it better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But both he and my dad wanted to go out and play baseball instead of going to Japanese school. Hmm. Do you know of any other immigrant group, as someone I know you've taught um, uh, minority literature for many years, that names the generations? Oh, that's a good question. No, uh, usually I hear it as first, second generation, whatever. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of groups, well, I, sh I shouldn't say a lot, but the ones I remember, for them, the first generation is not the immigrant generation, mm -hmm. see. In, J in J J Japanese Americans, the Issei, the first immigrant generation, is the first generation. Nisei, the Ni is the Japanese word for two, right? Am I right? Thank you. Uh, uh, and then, and so, Issei, Nisei, Sansei, so I'm Sansei. So I'm the third generation, but I'm the second generation born in the United States. And, but a lot of groups, the first generation is the first American born. Mm -hmm. Generation. Yeah, I, I can remember um, taking courses from you. The first time I heard that, I thought it was profound. And I've uh, studied literature of many other cultures, and I've never actually seen that named as such. And I, I, I think that that to me is almost another act of resistance uh, in a way to assimilation by continuing to understand and acknowledge that uh, naming convention, I think, is important. Um, most of us know the story of internment, or as you call it, incarceration, which I think is uh, a profound one. And the terminology, I think, is important. Can you talk about why you chose that word to describe it, and whether there are some acts of resistance by Japanese Americans during World War II and afterwards? And then I'll ask a follow-up question to that as well. Well, I was, I was as far as the term is concerned, incarceration mm -hmm. as opposed to internment, I'd always wondered about using the term just as a writer because they said, well, I, I don't want this to be confused with internment camps in Europe because that was a very different, uh, it was captivity, it was detaining, it was so on, but it was different. And, and I said, well, there's that. And then I read around on it and, and I said, well, it, it 
technically it's not the right term even. Mm. And then a fellow named Roger Daniel, Daniels, I think it is, Roger Daniel without the S, um, who'd done a lot of work on Japanese Americans and the camps and so on. Um, he wrote a, a very helpful article uh, called uh, something like Words Do Make a Difference, and it's in the, uh, cited in my book, in the bibliography. And he, he gives a really good argument about why we should call them uh, incarceration mm -hmm. camps mm -hmm. rather than internment camps. And so I made a point of saying th that they're often referred to as internment camps. And if you did a Google search, you would find them under internment camps, right? So I, for research purposes, I wouldn't want to lose all those citations because people didn't look under internment. Um, but I think that incarceration is, is a better, better term. Internment has to do with, well, we have the association with Germany, and then it, it, it's tied in military terms with, uh, the, uh, with detaining or imprisoning uh, en uh, alien enemy combatants. And of course, the Japanese Americans were not combatants. Mm -hmm. They were just civilians. Um, so that, there was another part to the question. Well, I was going to say, fast forward to the media post 9-11 era, did you view the legal protection of terrorist suspects uh, through the lens of the, to the Japanese American experience? And how did you, do you see any relationship between the two of those, given this idea of internment and incarceration? I don't have an answer to that question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I will tell you what that made me think of, though. What, what the parallel that I saw, or that I kept seeing when I'd read the, pick up the paper, was I said, the Japanese American incarceration, mm -hmm. internment, the, the reaction to the Japanese American presence in the United States, even before that, reminds me of what's happening on our southern border right now. Mm -hmm. I said, there is, there are, uh, there's some latent bigotry. There's a lot of uh, negative propaganda put out about people. There's a separation of families. There's detention without knowing when it's going to end, mm -hmm. right? When the Japanese Americans went into the camps, Nobody knew when the war was going to end. And they weren't, so people said, well, you're going into the camp. We're at war with you guys. It was an indefinite sentence. And so I kept, I kept thinking, all these, the Japanese American experience could be a blueprint about how to do this wrong, you know, what not to do. But they did it in 1941 or 42. But that's what I saw. Mm -hmm. That's what I saw in that uh, when I uh, would pick up the papers. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's. Yeah. Uh, when you think about the, the propaganda and those groups who um, attempt to support or not support or be a part of that, uh, I think about your discourse in the book about the Japanese American Citizens League. And how effective do you think they were in pushing back against discrimination? Because at one point, you, out, you actually suggest that they were too obedient and trusting towards the U.S. government forces. And you say the group didn't have what might be called, quote, a mature and active political consciousness. Talk to me a little bit about that. Let me tell you why I said that or what I meant by that. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes back to, again, the treatment of this particular immigrant group by the United States government. The, the, the ISE, the immigrant generation, was prohibited by law from become city, becoming citizens of the United States. Not being able, not being citizens had repercussions. Mm -hmm. How does not being a citizen of the United States affect your voting rights? Mm -hmm. 
How does it affect your employment? How does it affect any number of things? That's a linchpin to the future. Hmm. That's a mixed metaphor too, mm -hmm. but that's I'm right, she's you. going, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. uh, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what happened was this, my grandparents' generation, born in Japan, came to the United States in, uh, in the last, either the last decade of the 19th century or the first decade of the 20th century. By 1942, they lived in this country 40 or 50 years. Mm -hmm. They couldn't, they couldn't do any number of things that citizens could do. Not only that, contrast them with an Irish immigrant on the East Coast. Irish immigrant lands in New York or Boston, and some guy named Kennedy says, hey, I know where you can live. I can help, I can tell you where a good school is that your kids could go to. All you have to do is vote for me. I just made up that name Kennedy, it's random. <laughs> But do you see, see what I mean? So what happened was this. In 1942, the JCL, that gener the Nisei, created the JCL. Many of the majority of the Nisei weren't even 21 years old. Oh. So it was older Nisei that helped create the JCL. But they didn't have any experience handed down by their parents of how to negotiate American politics. Does that make sense? Do you see what oh. happened? So they're, in that sense, they're naive about things. Mm -hmm. They had read, they had take, gone to public school where they read, you know, they saluted the flag, read, you know, const, read about the U.S. Constitution, believed that the Constitution worked, hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Bill of Rights and so on. And um, they said, we have the Constitution on our side. Never entered their mind, no, I'm, I'm, I'm overstating this, but only slightly. It never really entered their mind that the, that the Constitution could either be ignored or the laws of the United States could be somehow skewed mm. to disadvantage them. Mm. And this is totally aside from the fact that um, as they were growing up, they saw all kinds of um, exhibitions or declarations of uh, prejudice of uh, bigotry toward them as Asian immigrants. And, uh, but, uh, so when they, when they tried to deal with the government, talk to the government, here's, here's another thing that happened. Their parents were not fluent in English, were they? Mm. So imagine most of us even being thrown into that situation where, okay, you're going to be talking, representing Japanese Americans you're going to be talking to some government attorneys. Yeah. So, I mean, they hadn't even, never even been to Washington, D.C. I've been there, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But they hadn't been, so it's very intimidating. It's alien. Mm -hmm. And so they did what they could, but the government kept um, cajoling, between cajoling and intimidating them. And there have been some books on, on what happened at that time. So I, it may, I may come out as uh, more what, harsh toward the JCL than I wanted to be, but I wanted to point out that um, they didn't fully understand what they were up with. You know, we have that cliche, you bring a gun to a, a knife to a gunfight. Well, that's kind of what happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, they didn't have allies because why? Their parents had come to the United States, lived in the United States all that time, couldn't vote. So who were their representatives in the Congress? Hmm. There, were, there were only a few, and I mean if you count them on the fingers one hand. There was a fellow in the Congress from Oregon named Richard Neuberger. Uh, he might have only been in the state legislature, but he stood up for the Japanese Americans. Uh, but he was a lonely voice. Mm -hmm. Later he went to the House and he went to the U.S. Senate. Uh, Neuberger had gone to school in Portland with Japanese American, you know, his classmates at Lincoln High School were Japanese American, a lot of them. 
He said, these are the kids I went to school with. Uh, but otherwise, there were no advocates for oh. them, no allies. Um, I don't did, I don't know if that answers. No, it did. And it, what I find provocative about your assertion is this whole question that we are continuously to revisit right now in this country about the disenfranchisement of, of populations of people through voting rights, um, through the continuous reexamination of an American dream or American philosophy that we um, don't see practice. It's a philosophy. It's an ideal that we constantly revisit over and over and over again without any seemingly recognition that we've done this before. Yeah, um, I, and we need to do something different. Or right. here's a, something that we can do that might help us put us in a better step. But instead, we think like this is the first time we dealt with it. And oh, and by the way, let's go ahead and put children in camps. Let's separate them from their families. Let's systematically destroy voting rights in this country, but we're going to make America great again. Yeah. Well, I, I have this list that I somewhere here. It's, it's kind of the um, the list of how to, how to do immigration. Mm. And it starts with recruit or kidnap and bring to the United States, and exploit, and uh, which includes underpay. Mm. Um, um, marginalize, denigrate, um, um, detain, which I think includes imprisonment, uh -huh. I mean uh, criminal justice, um, huh. and, uh, and then if possible um, de uh, deport, uh -huh. you know, go back to wherever it was that you came from or that we think you came from, and then Repeat. Yeah. yeah. Right? You forgot to put dehumanize, dehumanize. in there, too. That's, that yeah, would be the other uh, one. That, that, yeah. That'd be in there somewhere, too. It's in the list, I think. Mm -hmm. You're right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the ultimate expression of otherization, is it not? Yeah. To dehumanize you. Yeah. yeah. So you, you talked about these values of education. And, um, and that, I find that to be very provocative because this idea of a national identity and seeing education as a long-term success of a people in a country, um, uh, I think, was prescient in terms of helping to define the, the area. I, let me ask you this question, though. Has this emphasis on education empowered Japanese Americans? <clears throat> you write that there were plenty of doctors in the internment camps. Or has it limited them? such as far as advancing the model minority um, stereotype that we see? And does this somehow pit Asian Americans against other racial minorities in this country? Because I think there's a, a very interesting part about um, how education uh, can be seen as a tool or asset, or it can be seen as a great divider uh, when not used in a way to bring groups together. What, what is your thinking? Uh, their answers are yes and yes. Mm. Um, Education, uh, as I said, Japanese Amer as a as a group, Japanese Americans had uh, were considered more desirable than Chinese immigrants because of this extra. They, they had more education, education than the Chinese, and even though both groups sequentially were recruited as as labor, as labor, but. Um, the Japanese government promoted Japanese uh, immigration on the grounds that their educated people were populace. more educated yep. than, than Chinese. You know, they're not, they may be Asian, but they're not Chinese. Uh -huh. Really, you uh -huh. know. And then, um, so, um, they, um, education, was useful, was, was helpful. And, and uh, it led to, even back there when, when my parents were in school, one of the things you could count on with the Japanese American kids in school was they wouldn't cause any trouble. Mm. Seriously, they were not, as my, my dad called it, deportment. They were not deportment problems. Mm. So uh, they, they weren't even, you didn't have to be a nerd student, you know, to at least be not a troublemaker right. for the teacher. That counted for something. 
I'm a teacher, it counts for a lot, you know. <laughs> so, um, it, well, and in fact, because the students worked hard and they had support at home, as much support as you could stand for doing homework, right? Seriously, they did pretty well in school. So much so, that, and they were told, we would like you to go into a profession if you can. So when the, when the government, when the Army did a head count with the 442nd during the war, the all Japanese American segregated unit, somebody came up one day and said, you have too damn many doctors in this unit. <laughs> and by the way, you've got too many dentists too, but let's not dwell on that. But that was true. And that's why my dad started out training with a 442 and ended up getting transferred out because they said, we've got to assign some of you guys to, uh, to uh, other units. Mm -hmm. And so he was this Japanese American doctor with a bunch of Caucasian paratroopers. Mm -hmm. And I said, why did you end up, how'd you end up in the paratroopers? He said, well, they volunteered me for that. <laughs> and I said, one time we were watching uh, one of those war movies. Maybe it was The Longest Day. You remember that one? And I, the parachutes are coming out of the B-50, whatever it is. And uh, I said, um, now, as it turned out, he never did a jump. He came down in a glider that was shot up. But I said, was that what it was up there? And he said, yeah, but usually he said, with every plane load of soldiers, they shoved one scared doctor out the door. <laughs> so he had the jump training, but he didn't jump. He came down. They figured out after a while that if the doctor parachuted, but the medical supplies came down in, in, in a glider, a mile and a half away, mm -hmm. nobody would be well served. Mm -hmm. So they said either you're going to come down with the equipment and you both be okay or not. But you'll be together, you and the equipment. It's true. That's what he, he explained. But they did have, okay, so here's the thing. Asian Americans generally, and Japanese Americans as a subgroup of that, let's say they're, they're fairly successful. They're known for being good students. Good at math. Good at math. <laughs> I'm not good at math. <laughs> so, I'll tell you, I can tell you a story about that. But anyway, anyway. Um, but they, they became good students. So then we have the model minority stereotype. And then Asian Americans, Japanese Americans, even sometimes Korean Americans, they're all shoved together. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, um, they're, and as a model for other groups. Mm -hmm. So African Americans, Latinos, why can't you be good like the Japanese? You know, why can't you? It's just calculus. <laughs> well, you, you know, I mean, but, but they are put in as in the middle of some kind of sandwich huh. between two pieces of white bread. Is that a bad metaphor? That was good. She liked that one. Okay. Well, I mean, do you, you see what I mean? And, and, and being, but being told that you're the model. And then, so if a person is a member of one of the other groups, they come to resent these, these people that are always put up on a pedestal, right? So then if you're Japanese American, you say, well, I can't win either way. If, if I don't succeed, then I don't succeed. If I am a successful person, I'm, I'm, criticized by other people from other groups who haven't been as successful for, I think we all know this, for totally other reasons. They, were, they haven't been as successful, right? And even then, we're generalizing. Uh -huh. One thing I learned early on, there's no such thing as a good stereotype. <laughs> Why is that? It's still stereotypical thinking. Uh -huh. It's still not thinking. When you judge anybody, you know, as part of a stereotype, you're not really judge you're really not treating them as an individual. Right? So that that's that's not thinking. That's just reacting. Huh. 
one time, I, I, first day of class, I walked in. You know, you have your lectern. I put my books down there. There's still already students. So they want to be there first day of class early, you know, get a seat in the front, which is fine, you know. And um, this, this one kid, he starts stacking up his stuff. He closes his notebook, puts his... Um, and I thought, oh, man, this guy doesn't want a Japanese-American person teaching William Faulkner or whatever it was that I was going to teach. And, and, he, and I sort of looked at him like, what's up? You know, that's, I didn't say anything, but he, and he keeps flipping his stuff together. And he, I said, problem? And he said, I think I'm in the wrong room. He says, this is going to be math, right? <laughs> True story. I said, not if I can help it. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's the stereotype, see? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't have been an insult to him for me to be a... Okay, question. So I, I, Am I, I holding this up right? <laughs> okay. So I, I'm going to ask one more question and open it up for the audience. But just so you all know, I have at least half a dozen more questions. Uh, but because this is the time I get to ask him questions and him not ask me questions. Uh, but uh, if you want to make your way, uh, there will have some microphones that will be here in the center uh, in a little bit. We can do it. I, I want to talk to you, ask you to talk a little bit about, I'm fast forwarding for those of you who are um, uh, following along with some of the slides to question 11. Can you tell us about how your father's experience embodied some of the complex identity markers of his era? Uh, from his birth in Portland, Oregon, uh, to the Boy Scouts and Eagle Scouts in the U.S., to working as a farm laborer in medical school, and then ultimately what his dreams were for you as his son? It's about four questions. I know. <laughs> <coughs> See, I the real test the is can I even remember what the question is? Yeah. Um, so the, how did that begin? About your father and how, we, his, how he embodied this complexity of this experience of being a Boy Scout, and he was born in Portland, Oregon, and uh, worked as a farm laborer. He was a, a series of perhaps contradictions to what people thought in their mind regarding the stereotypes, right? He, he thought of himself, now I'm, I'm, again, I don't want to over general, generalize, mm -hmm. but he, he always thought of himself as an American boy. Mm -hmm. And he, he was, he said, you know, I learned how to swim with the American Red Cross, who also taught me how to be a lifeguard, lifesaver. And he says, I was a member of the Boy Scouts of America. And, uh, I was, and he was an Eagle Scout. And uh, so he always felt, again, he's, it was two sentences. He says, my mom and pop were born in Japan. I was born here. That's who I am. And he knew he was a citizen of the United States because he was born in the United States. Um, and uh, when he was in, uh, he was in the, res when the war started, he was already in the Army Reserves. Uh, and then it was a uh, foregone conclusion that he would go into the, the military and, and serve his country. And he never thought of Japan as his country, mm -hmm. or uh, and and uh, you asked about the shint, the question about the um, samurai. Mm -hmm. Well, for for most for the vast majority of the Japanese Americans, the, the, Ameri the United States was their country. Mm -hmm. So if they were going to be loyal to a country, it would be the United States. They'd never been to Japan, or they'd been there visiting with their parents, but they, what did they know? You know, they didn't. So, um, but my father, um, that was kind of the, the point of reference for him was that I'm an American mm -hmm. and I, I will always demonstrate that. It, I, that was part of your question, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, was there not, there was and what was his hopes for you as his son? He wanted me to be a doctor uh, and uh, he, uh, Oh, he liked that I played baseball, that I liked baseball. And by the way, baseball is very important. 
uh, to that generation in America, in the United States, baseball, because they, they didn't have any big the NFL or the NBA that wasn't on the that was still on the horizon. Baseball is very important as an Americanizing uh -huh. force. And, and uh, baseball had been introduced in Japan when? Does anybody know that? Back in the 19th century. So the Japanese immigrants to the United States had already been introduced, introduced uh -huh. to baseball. And they took to baseball partly because it was American and it was kind of a new thing, you know. But think about baseball and your samurai and your Shinto and your residual Shinto and your residual Buddhism and the dev teamwork. Yeah. Right? Um, the brotherhood of a team. It's like your, your, your relationship with your, uh, your kin, you know, your uh, prefecture, mm -hmm. uh, your village, your country. Mm -hmm. You know, and the idea of sacrifice fly or sacrifice bunt, you're giving yourself up for the larger, you, you see where I'm going with that? Mm -hmm. That it, it all kind of made sense then. They said, yeah, okay, there's, that's a game we can understand. And you know what? You can win this game if you hit six straight singles and they only hit one home run. So you don't have to be six feet tall to play this game. I'm, I mean, they're serious. They, and they would do that. They loved baseball. Uh, and it was an American Americanizing, mm -hmm. can I say that, mm -hmm. uh, force to learn American sports. Baseball was one of the key ones. They built hundreds of baseball diamonds inside the camps. They made uniforms out of rice sacks. They did all kinds of wonderful things in the, in the camps as a way of but see, it's an American sport. They're still playing baseball inside the camp, even though the United States put them in the camps. Hmm. Some, anyway, was there one, another? No, that's it. I, I'm going to uh, post, I invite the audience for questions. Um, and I certainly can uh, have more, but I would welcome that. Please, sir. I have a question. Please, sir. Are you in micro my microphone right there? I, yeah, OK. Thank you. Before you started speaking, I glanced through your preface of your book. That yeah. Up. Thank you very much for the copy. You mentioned in there that um, you had a phone call from uh -huh. someone according, uh -huh. responding to your letter supporting the legis passage of the legislation for um, redress, and he couldn't understand why the Japanese enemy would be getting compensation. Uh -huh. And no matter how you tried to explain to him, he just couldn't understand. Even then, when you told him, well, your last name sounds German. You must be a German descent, you know. And and point out. I think you pointed out your father fought in the in the eighty uh, seventh Airborne and Battle of the Bulge, and yeah. they still can't understand. And I think many Japanese American, Asian Americans, are always asked, "Where are you from?" Oh, I'm from Bethesda. No, 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 no. Where are you really <laughs> from? <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, you alluded to something that may be the answer to that. And you mentioned, and I'd like you to expound on this, is that you said the Issei people were not allowed to get citizenship, so they're denied the voting franchise. Consequently, they weren't represented in Congress. So of all the immigrants into the United States, it's the Asians who are always considered foreign. Where are you from? Because they were never represented in Congress and never appeared in public as a public official. But what's interesting, and I might just add this before you turn it back to you, is that when I lived in Europe, I was never considered a foreigner. I was always considered, well, a foreigner, I was a foreigner, but not Japanese or Chinese. I was always considered a Yankee. Yeah. <laughs> they understood it better than the Americans here. Yeah. It, 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 when you get a chance, read the poem in there. Uh, there's a poem in the book. Don't be afraid. It's, a, it's, a, it's kind of free verse. It's not. Uh, it's called Home and Away. I think that's the title. I wrote it. I better remember. Um, and it's about, um, it ends with a reference to being Yankees, the Japanese, the Nisei. It's being referred to as Yankees. Um, Oh, that phone call turned out to be wonderful. Uh, wonderful as as a 
point of reference for my thinking. Because when I talked to that fellow from the next town over, uh, it's, it's called Boone, Boone, Iowa, like Daniel Boone. He was a former POW, as I remember, but with a, he had a German name. Well, half the town's German, so he's mm -hmm. one of many people from, with German ancestry. And uh, he called me be, uh, for the reason that y your first name is? Chuko. Chuko? Did he mention? Uh, but uh, I, I realized after a while, as it, maybe just as a teacher, I don't know, I said, this guy just wants to talk at me or talk to me, a combination. But he could never understand the redress. He thought, we're giving money to and the enemy. They're the ones that put me in, in a prison camp. And I said, no, that was the Japanese, you know, yeah, and so on. Well, um, I realized that the pain he had suffered hmm. during the war was his own pain. It was real pain. Mm -hmm. And it kept him from understanding my story. You know, and I thought, you know, what I can do right now is just let him let him tell me his story. And I, and I was thinking about my mom never talking about the camps. And I said, I'll bet you he's never even told his own kids this story. And I said, so this tells me something about the work I need to do to, to finish writing this story. Because some of it was written. And I said, this guy is one of the keys to it. Because the pain, the wounds are deep, and I got to go find out what happened and, and what it means to people, and so on. So that that was. I don't know if I speak. I'm speaking well to your point, but um, no, he didn't understand. But I realized I wasn't going to change his mind right then. I could tell. He even told me. He said, "You know, my son-in-law says the same thing you're saying, but I still can't believe it." Hmm. So I said, well, this is beyond, you know, it, it's a truly emotional wound for him. I, I, I meant it. I had great sympathy for him. And he served in the same, in the Army, just as my dad had. My dad wouldn't talk about that much, that, that being in the war. He saw too much that was just worse than any operating room he was ever in in the United States, trying to do triage in Germany, Belgium. I once, I, I got to study abroad as a junior in college, actually in Germany, but that's another story. And I came back and I said, uh, uh, did you ever think of wanting to go back there? And he said, he said, no, <laughs> because it, Europe meant only battle scars to him. Oh. I said, well, you got to see some countries. He said, yeah, he said, we landed in England, went to France, we ended up in Berlin, and I saw that little bitty country, Luxem something, <laughs> you know, and, he, and then he said, and a whole lot of Belgium. That's where he got shot. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, there have to be other questions. They're, they're good. Yay! Thank you, sir. I graduated from Iowa State in 1980, but I don't remember you. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I got to live in Japan, and I believe Japan is the only industrialized country that still has a nature-based religion intact and part of the dominant culture, which is Shintoism. Did you see any influence of that integral part of nature in Japanese people's lives? in the, your Japanese-American life here in the States? I, what I saw, I don't know uh, if I could attribute it to that. Um, uh, well, when, when, you, when you say that, most of the people I knew were gardeners. And uh, I mean, that's a simple level. I realize that. And mushroom hunters and um, uh, like that. And even my grandparents, my mother's parents were not great gardeners, but they always had a garden. They had roses and beans and stuff. I don't, I don't, I can't answer that question very well, but uh, it's intriguing to think about that. 
I, I want to ask a, a similar question if you want uh, to make your way there. You write poignantly about several women in this memoir. Oh, yeah. uh, your mother Mary, your aunt uh, Fumi, Fumi uh, your other aunt Tana, who was named after the state of Montana, and you're very careful about delineating the experiences of women from men in this book. Why is that? It's because I realized after, well, I, re I re you know, I did learn something from teaching. Are you going to be all right? All right. Okay. I, from teach, seriously, teaching American lit, teaching uh, women writers as well as male writers. And um, the, the, the stories, the voices in the stories are very different mm -hmm. for, you know. And I said, it's easy and tempting to tell this story from the point of view of the visible history. Hmm. Right, you can write that. I am going and, to. Right? And like my dad's service in the military, it's all, it's there and so on. But I said, well, what about the wives and mothers and the sisters and the aunts? And they're the ones that are, that are they have a story too. And their lives were impacted by and so on, the war and the camps. And I said, I need to know those stories too because they're a part of this in a very important way. And now one of the ways that became clear to me was that I realized from the beginning that I needed a timeline to write this book. Mm. And the, the, the timeline started with, uh, well, I worked backwards and forwards from it. But, you know, it, technically it started in 1790 when the U.S. government said uh, you could only be a citizen of the United States if you were a white male or whatever. You could only vote if you're a white male. Well, okay. Um, but, uh, so I had all these key dates from American history, you know, when the 14th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, and, so. and then I put in the dates for my family, when my mother was born, when my grandfather came to the United States, because I wanted to see their dates in relationship to the laws and regulations that they had to live with. Hmm. Or to be born in the United States, my mother was born in 1915. When did women get the right to vote? So, see, she, she's in that generation, first, this generation that gets to vote, if you're, you know. And so I said, okay, all of these things are, they help me ask questions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I, and I said, I never thought of it quite that way. I never thought of it. And um, so anyway, th uh, that, I'm going to let him ask the uh, question, but uh, and then I'll come back. Okay. Okay. Here's a question. I'm glad you, you mentioned your teaching background because uh, there's some of us in the room here who are students here at the college, and uh, I'd like to know from your perspective uh, about Dr. Pollard as one of your students, and when <laughs> well, tell us tell us a little bit about that. And when she came into your classroom, did she sit on the front row? Can you remember any of that? This ought to be good. <laughs> That's so long ago that I... <laughs> well, I don't know the answer to that. I can't remember the answer that... She doesn't have to sit in the front row for somebody to notice her because she's going to make sure you know she's in the room, right? I don't mean that as a negative, but if she had a question, she would ask it. If she had a comment, she would make it. And as a teacher, I mean, any teacher will tell you, you appreciate students who, who make their presence known in the classroom. Uh, and uh, she was always open to something new. And my job was always to be able to present something that the students hadn't already thought, or present something that would make them think twice about what they are, what they thought they knew, right? And uh, it wasn't in your class, I don't think, but when I would teach Robert Frost and um, Langston Hughes and 
be the same class, it'd be Tony Morrison and and uh, Wallace Stevens and so on. And I, 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 I was I was teaching, and I said, we we sometimes we refer to Langston Hughes as a great African American poet. Why don't we refer to Robert Frost as a great white poet? <laughs> Because we think of that as the norm, that everything else is different from, hmm. you know, I said, so let's quit doing that, right? Um, now, I, I mentioned that because th th this was a class in which it was important to disabuse students of habits of mind that weren't helping them understand the, the, the literature. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, So anyway, it was great to have her in the class, and I never forgot her. She obviously never forgot me, but <laughs> I have, I want to say this. I have had students say, years later, when I ran into them, they said, I walked into that class, and I had no idea what it would be like to have a Japanese-American, American-lit professor. And I said, well, you found out. <laughs> right. Um, there was something else in your. Didn't you have something? Can else? I say one thing though about him as a teacher? So he was the first teacher of color that I had at Iowa State University, and that was very profound, particularly stepping into an English classroom as well. And he was the first faculty member where I learned and heard of the word other. And I've always remembered that and, and how one can otherize people in such a way to dehumanize them uh, in a lot of ways to uh, suggest that their narrative, that their truth is not worthy of being part of the canon. Uh, one of the things that I uh, studied a lot, uh, I think I maybe had two or three undergraduate classes from Dr. I still can call him Neil, Dr. Nakadati and uh, two or three graduate courses, and then he uh, was on my thesis uh, d team, a uh, defense for that, was always pushing me to go deeper. Uh, I, I still, to this day, I think I said it the last time I saw you, it still ticks me off to this day. One of the first S papers that I wrote for him as a graduate student, and he a had the audacity to send this back to me a couple years ago. I wrote a paper, which, you know, I thought was brilliant. <laughs> and he got it back, and he had graded it in red ink. To this day, I never grade in red ink because of this. But it was on the top, Didi, because he, that was those that called me in college, Didi, and it had an A slash C. And I said, what, what is that? Do I average it out as a B? I mean, what, what does that mean? And then underneath, he had writing flaws, content good but dot, dot, dot. I still remember that. Now, some of y'all, y'all kind of feel some kind of way about that, because I felt some kind of way about that. And I remember it made me angry, because I thought this was good stuff that I just wrote. And he got caught up in the writing flaw. And I thought, it's just the writing, it's the, but the content. And I remembered how angry I was at that, but then how it made me go home that weekend and he said, you could read, and I think I walked and marched him to him after class, and because clearly I had something to say. And I, you know, I was like, what does this mean? And he said, you can revise that or not. And I just kind of, and I, was, and I wanted to say, well, how's that going to be in the grade book? But I just kind of left it alone. And I went home that night, and that weekend, I revised that paper. And it made me work in a way that I hadn't had to work thus far in that program. And that is what I remember about him. So then when I got it back and I earned that A, that's when I said, oh, okay, this is my dude right now. I got it. I got it. So he's always been my dude as a result of that. Great. Yeah, I saw someone had a question. Ah.
Hello. 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 Oh, I feel like a singer. All right. Um, today is actually, tonight's the public hearing of the racial equity and social justice legislation that was um, introduced by the county council just a couple weeks ago here, um, which requires every government department to re-examine their programs and their policies and processes uh, with a racial equity and social justice lens. I wanted to ask you, you're the same age as my father, uh, and my father said to me that, that this legislation was too late. Should have happened a long time ago. And so I wanted to know your opinion on how you feel about that, that finally in 2019, it's been acknowledged that you gotta re-examine something that's already been done and damaged uh, for many generations. Oh. You know, you know, all the, all the publishers, at least during my career, uh, had uh, b book sales reps who used to come around and try to get their books adopted in the classes. Um, and uh, one time, uh, one of the book reps and I were chatting, and we were talking about the freshman comp or whatever it was, and and he says his name was Martin. I'm supposed to say I'll call him Martin, but his name was Martin. <laughs> <coughs> And uh, he said, you know what the strongest moving force is in higher education? Or the strongest force in higher education? And I, I wasn't a young professor, and I said, no, what? And he says, inertia. Oh. <laughs> and I, th I guess if I were talking to your dad, I'd say, well, you know, some things are taking too damn long, and it's partly because of inertia. Uh, and not only that, as a teacher, I'd say we have, there are some things about which we have to reteach. We have to, have to renew the lessons. Um, and it's like we were saying about half an hour ago with the uh, idea of immigration. The same patterns are being followed. The, the, I, I, I know I said this, but the Japanese American uh, incarceration, internment experience is a blueprint for what's, what could hap what is happening and can happen to other groups. Um, so as long as that can be the case, maybe it's, maybe, you know, we shouldn't say, oh yeah, it should have. Well, it should have, but we, we shouldn't have to keep repeating it or renewing it. But maybe, maybe we do, oh. you know? Um, see, one of the ways to not do it is to say, I thought we already did that. Let's move on. Well, uh, isn't there a group, an organization uh, called Move On? Yes. You know, that's not there for no reason. Uh, but we can't, you can't just move on. That, move on is also leaving something behind. Yes. Is that okay? Did, I mean. Hello. Um, in the book you speak about the uh, how Japanese women were um, doubly sheltered um, oh. and how they were treated in certain way in home space as well as having to deal with the, um, the general attitude of the public space. So how much of the public attitude towards women at the time impacted the gender, reinforcing the gender norms in the private space because a lot of time the way women are treated in public spaces has a huge impact on the way they're treated in the homes. Sure. Um, and also, even though that was there in the beginning, uh, the beginning chapters of the book, really speaks about how women were the ones who were reinforcing education. Like they were opening the uh, places where kids would come to after school. So Language if you could just, yeah, 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 of course. So the, the, in terms of you know furthering education, women had a role with that. So if you could just speak about the public and the private you yeah. like her Thank as you. a student. Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. I already do. Mm -hmm. That was part of one of your questions, mm -hmm. too. The, the one part that I lost. Hers is better. Um, where's, the, where's the, is this okay, microphone? Okay, so um, th my mother and my aunt, we used to have a slide for that. Did, did we lose it? Behind you. Oh, yeah, see? There they are. Um, the, um, they had to deal with both American and Japanese um, gender 
uh, expectations. Uh, and in both, women were supposed to be relatively passive, right? And um, at the same time, as the mothers of the, ch of the Nisei children, they were, they were um, having to um, help the children negotiate the two cultures. Um, so as much as they were told that their domain was the home, they knew that they were talking to the next generation that was going to go out that door to public school. So they knew that they had to pay attention to that too. Now the, the fathers were expected to go into the public world of commerce or law or medicine or, or labor or whatever it was, but the men would walk out the door and uh, even the salesman for the Furia company would learn English. They had to, otherwise they couldn't deal with the, the world outside the Japanese American uh, community. Um, so, it, uh, where are you? So, the, the, roles, the, the, the roles for women were very uh, challenging, I think, because on one hand, they're supposed to be passive and so on, and on the other, they knew quite well that that was not the world they lived in, you know, and wh what would that what should they do then? Now, as it turned out, for example, my aunt uh, was got married first, and, and her my mother was later. But my aunt got married, had two children, uh, and then she, uh, for reasons that are in the in the book, she did not end up going into the camp. She went into a TB hospital, and then she ended up getting divorced long distance while she was in the hospital, and her husband and the two girls were in camp. After the war, my, my aunt was the breadwinner for that family. She was a breadwinner for herself, the two daughters, and my grandparents, who no longer had a livelihood because they lost that because of the war. So she was, do you see where I'm going with that? As, an, as a version of a, a story that didn't fit anybody's norms. But practically speaking, she had to be out there in the world. And she did. She did a great job. Um, she was, uh, anyway, yeah. She had, a, she had. And uh, my mother ended up getting my dad's uh, army check every, every whatever so often on a regular basis, but because of family circumstances, my mother ended up being the hub of the wheel of communication for everybody in the family, because mm. she, could, she could read and write English and Japanese. So she could write to her parents in the camp. She could write to my dad and somewhere in Europe, to her brother somewhere in the Pacific, um, and, uh, and so on. And so she had to be out there in that sense in the world too, and to understand what was everybody's reality out there as much as she could. Um, but I, let, let me go back to where your question must have started. I, I learned more about the women in my family than I ever thought I was there even though I knew it was there. Do you know what I mean? I knew there was more that I didn't know. But by pointedly, consciously asking questions, I said, this is a whole different world from anything I would have understood without asking these questions. And I wish I had learned from my mother's mother how to make sushi. <laughs> she tried to teach me and I thought, give me a break. I wish I'd learned it now. Let me, uh, oh, uh, oh, yes, please, please. Go sorry. Go Hi, thank you for sharing this evening. As you were researching this book and talking with your family members and such, how did that influence the material that you brought into the classroom? 
Well, I would use, it would typically be in a multicultural lit course, mm -hmm. say, uh, but not always tr strictly, I'm trying to think of an example for what I'm about to say, uh, not always strictly having to do with Japanese American writer, because some of the experiences of Japanese Americans are, there are similarities in the experiences of other immigrant groups. And one of my goals in the course was to show these overlaps. So that it's like Venn diagram, you know, you see what I'm, I'd say there are ways these groups can understand each other because they share certain um, experiences. Um, but I would bring up examples from my family's story uh, to illustrate outside of, say, a work of literature, the point I was making. I'd say this happened to real people that I talked to. I've got it on tape. <laughs> um, yeah. And, um, uh, but it, it affected my teaching because, like uh, the point I just made about women in my family, even more than before, I was I paid attention to what was going on with the with the women in the stories or the uh, women poets or because because I said there's more more to it than to it than I thought of ten years ago, you know, so that those things mixed around. So if I could ask for two minutes on the title of the book, and then we'll wrap this up because we're going to go to the end. Okay. Looking after, well, as you mm -hmm. said, I, that was quite conscious. It, it's tied to the whole, uh, the fact that the internment incarceration story was often buried. Mm -hmm. It was often buried in the sense that nobody talked about it, or few people did. In my family, it was always deflected. They'd refer to camp, and I thought it was like YMCA mm. camp, you know. I mean, really, because they'd change the subject. So in, in getting the interviews from my family members and doing research in the library and looking at all that junk in the basement and so on, I'm looking after Minidoka. I'm looking after. And so after looking has multiple meanings, after, afterwards, looking after as in taking care of, mm. you know, and, and trying to bring it to light as best I can. Uh, so that was where that, that story. And subtitle at an American memoir, that's probably tied to the fact that my dad always said, I'm, American. I'm, a, I'm an American of Japanese ancestry. I, I was in the Boy Scouts of America. You know, I wanted to sort of make sure this is an this is an American story, and the last two words or the last four words, three <laughs> words, of the of the book, are the words that my mother okay. told me regarding her her name, which is not. I, I thought it was just Mary. She said, "Well, when I was named, it was Mer Merico, M E R I K O." Medico, and she said in the Japanese, uh, what do you call uh, kanji? Um, the way I, uh, we were told to write it, it means child of America, hmm. or child whose country is America. But, I mean, she said there are different ways you can take it. She said that's what it means, and I said this whole book is a child of America. This whole story is an American story good and bad and ugly and angering and and something to rejoice over and be proud of and to be frustrated about and um, to be maybe looked at when we think we're repeating it all over again. Hmm. On that note, uh, I want to thank Dr. Nakadati for joining us. Thank you all for being here. We have a number of students uh, from some of our humanities classes and I would like to thank uh, our community members who are here supporting. I'd also like to thank the Meyer Foundation who supports this series and provides the books for us. And most of all, thank you all for your willingness to engage in this subject and for letting me have a few minutes with one of my favorite uh, teachers. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for coming.